Now, here's one thing. I think two things I wanted to mention while I had you guys. Uh, you know, one, I'm going to put Fabs in. That's what I was about to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's, yeah. I've been in contact with some really knowledgeable characters. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin story? Too much alcohol. Really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because if God wanted us to have five glass boats, he would have given us five glass trees. It's it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit, as yeah. far as if I can remember uh-huh. correctly. <laughs> Welcome to the State of Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm Nick Carullo. Um, joined with me, my co-host, Anthony Pino with Hooked Optics and Captain of the Blood Money. Uh, tonight, our guest is Carl Allen, entrepreneur, owner, and rebuilder of Walker's K. Thanks for joining us, Carl. Appreciate your time. And uh, why don't you give a little intro and tell everybody who you are? Uh, thank you, Nick. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Carl Allen. I'm, I'm 57 years old. Uh, I was born in New York. On, on one of the Finger Lakes. I, I grew up... Uh, in Chicago on Lake Michigan and discovered uh, Stewart, Florida with my stepdad and walkers when I was 12 years old and, and uh, always dreamed of, of owning it. And that came true a few years ago. Oh, how'd yeah. you, how'd you get started in the, uh, in fishing overall, Mr. Allen? Well, if you, if you know where Rochester, New York is home of Kodak Xerox, it's uh Northern, Northern New York. Uh, there's a really neat little finger lake South of there called Canisius Lake. Um, it's about seven miles long and about a mile wide. And uh, my parents had a, a lake house there and I had a bunch of relatives. From, I would go there every summer and, you know, get into the sailing and sunfish and skiing. And, and one day I just picked up a fishing rod and started catching the sunfish and the bullheads and, and the bass. And there's a few northern pike and a few lake trout there. And, and I just I got addicted to it. And, and then moving to uh, Chicago and, you know, fishing for the coho and uh you know, the big uh, German Browns there in Lake Michigan, your downriggers out there. And then, uh, yeah, I was 12 years old. My stepdad had a home in Stewart, Florida, and he rented a center console one day. And we go out to the St. Lucie Inlet and just to the south there is what they call the kingfish hole. And, and we just slayed the Spanish mackerel. <laughs> and I mean, it was as a 12 year old, you can imagine, you know, it was like heaven on earth and probably ruined my, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, you know, educational career because <laughs> I was staring out the window thinking about fish. And th- did you kind of progress through your, you know, through, as you got older, you kind of got in, how do you get into, you know, owning, owning boats and then, well, and then keeping on fishing? Uh, my stepdad, you know, he had a, he had a home there for, he passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, he had a home steward for many, many years. And, and he started out, you know, with the center console and, a, and then he bought a, a topaz, um, a hatteras, and then he turned into just a Viking guy and uh, had a 65 Viking. And, you know, all those years we would take, uh, you know, summer trips to the Bahamas and, you know, go all the way down to Long Island, go go down to Hogs Tea Reef. Uh, Crooked was one of our favorite places. And so, you know, we just, all of us, all my, I had a bunch of stepbrothers and we just, we just loved going on those Bahama trips and we'd go in the summer and a little bit in the fall. And, and then of course, fishing off Stewart does all, all those wrecks there and they got the six mile reef. And, and uh, so I just kind of grew up doing it. I'm a big hunter too. I've been all, the, all over the world hunting and kind of stopped doing that when I retired and, and just, I just focused on fishing and, and, you know, when, uh, when walkers came available, it, it was one of these things more I got a chance to bring back to this sports fishing Mecca that's, that it's so well known for. And, uh, you know, it's, that was probably the biggest part of my dream come true was, was all the aspects of walkers, but specifically the, the sports fishing and bringing, yeah. bringing that back. Did you always like, obviously like it, it fell into disrepair after a storm in, in the early two thousands, correct? So yeah, in 04, it was hit by two major storms back to back Janine and Francis. I think I got that order right, but, uh, it pretty much decimated the Island and she sat there as a rock, you know, and, and my kids, there's a whole generation that doesn't really know what walkers mm-hmm. is. And so, you know, it's, I want to, I want to bring those people in the younger crowd, but also, you know, people my age and up to, up to about 30, you know, have this really incredible memory about walkers yeah. and where it used to be. 
Now, did you always feel like you were, you, even before it was, you know, you, you would go over there and experience it. Like, was it an inkling in you that you were actually going to own it before then? Or, you know, once the storm ta- storms came and they kind of, you know, it fell into disrepair, you, you kind of, that kind of lit the fire. Was it? Interesting question. I think I get asked that a lot. And I, I think I was always in love with it. I mean, I, coming over the banks when I was 12 and seeing walkers, I knew, I go, oh my God, think of the life these people have. And, and it was a dream to own it. Yeah. And then, you know, I had a very successful business and, and uh, luckily he was blessed with that. And so um, later on, I sold it five years ago and, and my wife and I kind of looked at each other, what are we going to do? And, and I kept, I'd gone to Walker since 04 and I kept my, brought my kids out there. We, we run down the runway and check out the old church and, and stuff like that. Um, but I think it was around 15, 2015 that I realized all these deals have been breaking up with walkers. Why isn't it selling to somebody? This is a gem. And a lot of it had to do with the family that owned it, the Apple apps. They didn't want to sell it to a corporation. They want to sell it to another family. And so it took me literally a year, you know, talking to the family in New York because it was so important to them. They want, they were going to bring it back eventually, I think, themselves. But the the matriarch, Mrs. Applenap, she's still alive. She's 95, sharp as a tack, remembered wow. everything about the island. And I think it was really important to her that she sold it to a family. And it was really neat. The day we closed was in April of uh, 2018. She called me and realized that, that they had closed on Walker's in April of... 1968, oh, which wow. is wow. 50 years later. Wow. And uh, it's, you know, pretty, pretty exciting. And I, I, w- I have been absolutely overwhelmed how many people are interested in, in that. Island. It's, you know, incredible. It yeah. kind of, it kind of opens you up to an area and I don't know the Bahamas, the fishing very much, but I look at the, the, the current charts there and it kind of opens you up to an area that is kind of not very much fished, you know, it, you know, most people fish that Northern area, as far as I know, you know, uh, up in that, you know, out towards the Abacos more. And yeah. then, and then, you know, obviously you could run, run to, uh, is that run over and fish the near side and from the States if you want to, but like, yeah. be there and, but there's yeah. just that giant area that's kind of, kind of. Uh, well, a lot of people like to fish the horn that's off, yeah. you know, about halfway between Florida and, and Walkers. And then the Manitilla Reef, people like that. And then, of course, Walkers. I mean, we we get, uh, we've had a wonderful Marlin or Marlin, a Wahoo season this year. Um, you know, looking forward to the spring. We can talk about my tournament coming up. Um, but I, the thing I say about Walkers is it's where the bonefish meet the billfish. And everything in between. I mean, I could I could sit here for hours and talk to you about about what we do every day out there. I have a rule that we we have to catch a fish at least one fish every day, and <laughs> some days that's pretty tough with the weather out there. Some days, so. I said, how many how many slips? Uh, how many boats can you hold there at the marina? Well, that's a good question, Nick. Um, it kind of depends on the size, but let's just say that I did all. Um, you know, center consoles and convertibles and things like that. I could, I could probably get up to about 75 boats. Wow. Uh, wow. But the way I did it, and I said this from the beginning, I'm trying to cater to the whole market because we're so close to Florida, well, we're hundred miles away, that um, we have a whole end of the marina dedicated to center console, um, you know, the convertibles and, and the uh, big sports fishing boats is my main passion, the main dock. Uh, walking down like you used to, to the gentry. And then, of course, I did something that's never been done at Walkers. We built a, a super yacht basin. Uh, one, because I got a couple of yachts I got to get into myself, but we can fit up to eight 200-foot yachts that draw up to 14 feet. Wow, that's impressive. So that's a little bit of everybody. Call me crazy, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, make everybody happy. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, the Allen exploration before we get into the the island. It, it, you know the restoration. I, I find that so so fascinating. What you you know. What yeah. You so um, Allen Exploration is actually an old company, um, but I, it really kind of got put on the map about five years ago when I sold. I, I was big into the plastics business. I was into uh, a real glamorous business. I, I used to make trash bags and, and diapers, okay. and. Um, I sold it. It was very successful five years ago. And I had had this company called Allen Exploration that I had done some amateurish uh, treasure hunting. And uh, part of it was I 
decided after I sold the company that I was going to turn professional. And so part of what we do is we are uh, licensed professional salvage hunters in, in the Bahamas. And that's kind of how it all, all got going there. So. Is there, is there anything you ch- or is there anything around walkers that you're, you've been chasing? Is there something like a ship that might be there, might not be anything like that? <laughs> I, I know you probably don't want to talk about it. <laughs> can't get, it can't give that away. I, mean, I, I can tell you this much and maybe we don't have to spend a whole lot of time in it, but I, yeah. I've been passionate uh, about, search and salvage since I met Mel Fisher when I was about 20 years old. I'm a, I'm a longtime diver. And I was down in Key West about two years after he found the Atocha. And um, I almost went to work for him, but he gave me the disease. And I was an amateur treasure hunter for years. And, you know, I, my kids never knew it, but everywhere we went, we were amateur treasure hunting and they would complain, dad, what are we doing? I said, shut up, kid, keep digging. And <laughs> we would go to these places and actually found I found some stuff in Puerto Rico. I uh, found some stuff in uh, 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 the Caicos, Turks and Caicos. But uh, my main, uh, you know, the Bahamas is absolutely loaded with wrecks. It, it took me many, many years to get a license. We have a museum that we're opening up, hopefully April 1st in Lucaya. And we've recovered a whole bunch of artifacts from an old wooden ship. Wow. And uh, we're going to go public here on it, I hope in the next, you know, 45, 60 days before the museum opens. It's extremely exciting. I mean, it's, it's fishing and hunting combined on steroids. It, it seems like the, uh, the only thing that may be, may be more expensive than, than sport fishing is treasure hunting. <laughs> well, uh, Anthony, you're onto something there. It is not cheap by any means. And if you, if you try and get in this business to make money, don't do it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's a real passion for me. I'm into the history of it. Um, I've, I've, you know, to spend 20 years studying it in, in the archives and reading every book you can imagine, meeting the old treasure hunters myself. I knew Mel Fisher for a little while. I knew I knew Bob Marks for a while. And, you know, if you think about it, the Spanish, well, all of them, the Dutch, the English, they all had to come through the Florida Straits. And if they made it to around say, Cape Canaveral and turned right, there's nothing in the way all the way to Spain. Yeah. But if you miss it, it's treacherous. And so there's literally thousands of, not all of them are treasure ships, don't get me wrong, but there are thousands of shipwrecks in the Bahamas and, and it's clear, warm water. I, I hate, you know, these guys that treasure hunt up in the Northeast and you have six inch visibility and you're, you know, got bull sharks running into you. But what we do is fantastic. Uh, it's a whole separate fleet of boats. I got, I got nine boats that just do that. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's going to be, uh, pretty exciting when it comes out. It's it's going to shock uh, a lot of people, especially the people who are the, in the industry and what what we've been able to find. Nice, amazing. And then and then going back to to Walkers, you know, you you started that journey. You know, you you bought the bought the island in 2018, April 2018, like you said. And then how long did it take you to get the ball rolling? Where you were like to get it to start the construction and then the reconstruction and then you opened up you kind of made the cut, the marina bigger and you made the, the cut deeper? Yes, we did. We doubled the size of the marina and we doubled the depth. So okay. it was just kind of neat. And we fixed up the whole, you know, uh, spoilage area that's, it's got a neat plan, but but here it is, guys. I'll, I'll give you the quick, the five minutes here is that we bought the island in 18. I spent about seven months planning and we, we started digging uh, around July of 19. And as you all know, what happened September 1st of 19, here comes Dorian. And the worst part of Dorian was not walkers because we didn't have a lot going on. We, we lost a dredge and stuff like that, but nothing big. But what it did to the Abacos, obviously, and what it did to Little Grand Key, my neighbor has 500 residents on it. And luckily, by some miracle, nobody got killed. Nobody even got hurt. Wow. But everything was devastated. They lost their roofs, they lost their water, they lost their power, sewage. And I put my whole fleet to work for, geez, about four months. We dropped everything at Walker's and all we did was go back and forth to the West End, to uh, Freeport, to Little Grand, uh, one trip to the Abacos. And I have, I have a big yacht support vessel that can hold a lot of stuff. And we delivered over over a million pounds of goods in three months, not including fluids like diesel fuel and water. And, but it slowed us way down. And little did I know, Dorian was going to be a road bump compared to what was coming. And a lot of people 
don't really understand that when the United States is suffering, multiply that by 10 for the behavior. You know, they're, they're basically an extension of, of the U.S. over there. And when we're suffering, it's real bad over there. And when the pandemic hit, 80 percent of their economy is, is their GNP is tourism. They lost 80 percent of that overnight. And the people over there just went they went fishing. <laughs> That's one of the things that it was the only place for them to get protein. I mean, it was amazing how many people you see fishing. They weren't you know, scarce of food. They were just broke yeah. because there was no money coming in. So I did a lot of things for Little Grand. We did a little stimulus deal for them. Um, you know, we brought in a bunch of food all the time. I, I, I did things like fix their landfill. I, I, I built them a brand new basketball court. Um, you'd be amazed at something as simple as a basketball court, how much joy that that can bring a torn community like that. And so, so my wife and I have kind of adopted the key a little bit and we realized that we're going to need a lot of those folks. You know, they're, they're so close, um, you know, and they've been just devastated. And so I can't complain too much because although we slowed way down, I've seen and witnessed what's going on with the rest of the folks and, and Abaco is just still, I don't know if that's ever coming back in some places. Um, but you know, when you go through the pandemic, the storm, a pandemic, labor issues, uh, complete economic meltdown, um, you know, we're not alone out there for sure. Um, we do consider ourselves the gateway to the northern Bahamas, and we're about two years late, you know, because based on everything, we, our marine is done. I've got wonderful Poralu floating docks. I've got power. I've got great fresh water. People love our water out there. And I've got a few little amenities. We've got a food truck going in. Um, it's fun to just walk around because it's in its, you know, its state where nothing's happening construction-wise, structure-wise. But um, the church is about done. Um, but I'm going to guess right now and tell everybody that we're hoping to have about 20 cottages open you know, sometime either late this year or early next year. So Yeah, I know that was definitely a, probably a big question for everybody. Yeah. as far as accommodations, but yeah. I know you're getting there. And uh, you guys are doing a, a tournament there this year? Yes, this is our second annual tournament. Very excited about it. We had a really good first year, uh, had 38 boats. This year we're going to have, I think, 47. And uh, it's an invitational. It's got to be pretty much sports fishing boats because I, I can't do the center constable because I don't have any accommodations really. Yeah. I'd love to do that. And I know a lot of those people hate me. I just, I don't have anywhere to stay for these guys. Um, we're probably a year away from doing some kind of tournament like that, but, but it's a Calcutta. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, hoping that uh, again, 47 boats, I, I've got a beautiful tent that I put up and, and again, the Marine is done. So it's, uh, I mean, I, you get that feeling already. Last year I walked up on the hill when all the boats were in the Marine, I just lost it. I just, I knew that I, I had did it. I, I had brought walkers back to at least the sports fishing part of it. Yeah. And, um, uh, this year, Fly Navarro is our, our sponsor this year is doing a great job. We've got some really neat things, some, some couple surprises this year, and it's a major impact to the local economy. Rosie, who runs the hotel and the, a bunch of businesses on the island said last year's tournament was the best weekend he, he has ever had in the history of Grand Key. Wow. And wow. so uh, it, the peripheral, you know, benefits is, is great for everybody over there. And, and um, eventually I want to, I want to get to four or five tournaments a year. Um, but this one is the big one. So yeah, that's amazing. And how many boats did you have there? Like throughout the winter, you said you had a good Wahoo season. Uh, you had some, did you have, other than big boats, you had some center consoles there too at all? Yeah, we get, we get a lot of visitors, you know, we get people that come in, don't know we're there yet. Um, we do monitor 74. If anybody's around there, please come in. There's, there's people there. Uh, we sell get fuel all 24 hours a day if you need it in emergencies. Uh, the docks are always open. You know, I'm, I'm basically, I'm five bucks a foot, all inclusive right now. And, you know, it's, it's very basic. You got the neat things, you got customs there, immigration. You know, if, if you fill out your stuff online, and, and show up there, uh, you can clear, you know, like that. Yeah. And it's, it's very, very easy. The one thing we're trying to bring awareness to people is, you know, Walkers has a national park north of it. We have a, a 10 square mile, basically a rectangle uh, that, you know, has never been really enforced or protected because they just, it's so far out that they don't have the research. But I'm a big proponent of it. I, I grew up going to Belize and I watched them protect the reef down there when I was a teenager and it exploded with life. And I want to do that same thing. I mean, if you talk to the local fishermen, 
they're complaining they have to go farther and farther away to get their catches. And I'm telling them, I'm saying, you got, you can't mess with the nursery. You, you got to have a place where everything can grow. And so I don't want to arrest people and fine them and stuff like that, but I do want to bring awareness to it. And so when people check in, we're going to show them where it is and just ask them, look, just please stay out of there. and Don't kill stuff. And yeah. if you do go in there, you're allowed to obviously dive and snorkel and stuff in there. And you can kill one thing. And that is you can kill all the lionfish you want. Yeah. And there are a few in there, but, uh, but it's something that I think that I've got a real challenge. You know, I've got to balance, you know, the environment with bringing walkers back to life and especially with kind of a new market. I mean, in the old days, you didn't have this army of, of center consoles. I mean, yeah. you've got these $3 million jobs out there today that they can get to walkers from Jupiter or Stewart in, in an hour and a half, yeah. you know? And so I'm going to try to institute a 12 foot rule, which is let's not kill anything 12 feet or up and that you don't have to go very far to do that. Okay. And the neat thing is from Walker's East, I don't know how much time you guys have spent up around that area, but it's nothing but uninhabited bonefish heaven. Yeah. Along with yeah. Carpet and permit and everything else mixed in there. We love mutton snapper fish and African pompano. We know where down plains are, sunken shrimp boats. Um, I've gotten to know a lot of the locals that kind of tell me where everything is and Oh my God, it's a menagerie. I can tell you the fishing out there is alive and well. Nice. So the 12 foot rule, anything obviously under 12 foot. Yes. And so go out, find 13 feet and you can pick up conch and lobsters and you can spear fish and stuff like that. But you know, the previous owner had that rule and it's not a law. I can't make laws obviously, but, but, but if you don't pay attention to the rules, well, you know, a lot of us do. You're not welcome back. <laughs> is, yeah. is, is that just a general rule? Is there anything behind that beyond, you know, just trying to make it a little bit more difficult to kill things? I mean, it's yeah. sort of, there is some science behind it, I think, you know, and, and it does, it just, it creates that nursery. I mean, yeah. the, the things that are real important as a nursery out there are the reef itself. And I'm, I'm telling you, the reef is, mm-hmm. even after going it's in magnificent condition, it, it, it's pristine. And it it's, you know, when you think about what's happening in the Keys, um, it's a gem we have out there and we got to protect it. But then seagrass. And, you know, we have a ton of that around. And if you go 12 feet, you know, you get way out there. There's a few wrecks. You can go get beyond that and stuff. But but again, it's it's a, it's a rule. I would hope people at least pay attention to it because, again, we have a real balance. I, I come from the, the trash business, as I told you, so I know a little bit about it. And I know about landfills and recycling and incineration and all that. And, and I'm going to try as, as best I can to make it a zero waste island. I'm doing away with diesel. I, I'm, I'm a Texan. I love natural gas. So we're going with LNG, which is a 99% reduction in emissions about a 50% reduction in, in noise and, a, and about a 60% reduction in cost. The, wow. the real problem with LNG is the initial capital of the machines. You're basically buying a jet engine. Is that, that for the generator that runs the power on the, on the Island? Is yes. that what you mean? Okay. Yes. Gotcha. And that'll run the Marina. It'll run the, you know, the resort. And, uh, and again, you will have zero emissions coming out of that thing. Correct. Wow. So as uh Back to what you're saying, is, is fishing prohibited in the marina? It isn't right now because there's not a lot of boats and there's kids that come in and stuff. But eventually, I'm probably going to have to do that only because, um, you know, it's funny. You watch Shark Week and they complain about shark populations around the world. Uh, we don't have that problem in, in yeah. the water. They <laughs> don't think anywhere problem. on the East Coast there's any issue with I that. Mean, I, I, even these last few years, I'm, it's boggling me. It's scaring me a little bit. I mean, we're, we're seeing huge sharks, big hammerheads. Out at the site, we're seeing tiger sharks, lemon sharks, makos we've seen. Um, we, we have a submarine uh, that we use. It's a Triton 3300. We saw we saw a great white off walkers last July at about 200 feet. Wow. And so so they're out there. But if you if you get we've had since I've owned the island, we've had three shark attacks, people that have had to fly out, no, no fatalities. All three of them were spearfish. And so it's about blood in the water and and uh I don't know how much you know about the history of walkers, but they used to have the shark rodeo back then where they'd take all the fish guts, freeze them, put them in a big ball, and then they would go out and put it out in about 80 feet and they would dive on it. And uh, over like 20 years, 
nobody got hurt. And it absolutely amazes me. Nobody got eaten. Wow. <laughs> so, but it's fun though. When, when you are looking for sharks because they are everywhere. Yeah. So oh, that's incredible. And just one more, how, how far North I'm back to that little sanctuary you're talking about. How far North of walkers is that? Okay, Nick. So it's about, it's 10 square miles. It's about 600 yards directly off of walkers. And then it goes past the reef about another 600 yards. So it's, it's, it's into the deep water a bit, but then all the way, you know, fairly close to the, to the island. Okay. Okay. I can, I can, uh, geez, I wish I had a map we could, we could post, but again, when people check in, we're going to have a, you know, a, a little sign there that shows, shows where it is and just ask you to, yeah. you know, and, and believe me, um, it won't take long. I mean, I, I think, uh, we've already been kind of protecting it with a, with a little patrol boat I got. And, uh, you give it a few years and yeah. that thing, will be, that thing will be a Mecca. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I know there's probably a lot of spear fishermen that are ready to get back to walkers. I know there's giant hogfish pulled out of walkers for many years. So, yeah, And the mud snappers, you know. And the other thing we're doing, too, I should mention is something about that reef. Uh, I partner up with a firm in, in Nassau, and we are planting um, over a 1,000 staghorn coral spots uh, wow. that – um, it's proven to work down south. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work up north. And, you know, you give that five or 10 years and, and we'll bring that back. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of exciting stuff going on. That's, that's amazing. You're doing great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, your your passion for the area is, is it's pretty, it's incredibly obvious. I think it's, it's awesome. Well, I mean, I realized that all the stuff that I want to do, it's, it, it's all kind of related. We've, we've done a lot of philanthropy, you know, buying the island, uh, doing the, you know, the studies that we do, the submarine and stuff. And, and then of course the salvage, um, I've been going there for 45 years and it, it's something that I'm a resident, um, the way things are going with our government, I'm thinking about becoming a citizen, uh, mark that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's my wife and I, and thank God my family loves it too. But um, we really, I don't, I don't, I, I like the mountains, but that's a place I like to visit. You know, yeah. I, I want to I call walkers home and live there. And, wow. and, and you know, I have a big fleet that uh, we, we move around a lot. We, we study a lot. And, you know, it's, it's something I just, I can't imagine life without yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. How have you, I mean, you've been there, go, going there for 45 years. How have you changed? What's the, have you seen it change, you know, for better, for worse? You know, is there, I mean, um, I, you know, I've seen, there's been a lot of suffering there. There's been, the Bahamas has a history of bad deals that, that hasn't helped them. But um, again, I come from the trash business. You know, it's like Hemingway used to say, the Bahamas are, are islands in the stream. And 80% of the trash on the beach is over there. And there's a ton of it. it doesn't come from the Bahamas. You know, it comes from this uh, DR. It comes from Venezuela. It comes from Haiti. Um, and it all comes this way, you know. And I think the one thing that, I want walkers to be kind of the kind of the canary in the mine shaft, you know, is that when we start seeing stuff like this out here, middle of nowhere, you know, the world needs to pay attention. Yeah. And I think even though Bahamas and walkers are a very small place, I think we can be a pretty large voice and people get a lot more involved and a lot more interested in wildlife, you know, and the environment when they experience it. And that's what I think key to walkers is, you know, don't go to, don't bring your kids to an aquarium. Aquariums are bad. They, you know, for every one fish that's in there, you've killed 10. Yeah. Come to walkers. I'll show you the real aquarium. You know, that, that's what we ought to be doing in this world is instead of bringing people to aquariums, bring the people to the oceans. And, and I think, you know, I've had kids out there that I ask them, I said, you know, what, what does a sea turtle eat? They, they say things like, oh, it eats hot dogs and chicken McNuggets. And I, no, guys, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't. And in some cases, it eats plastic and it clogs their systems and it kills them. So once they start to realize that, wow, if I pick up this piece of trash, I might be saving a turtle. It might, it becomes so much more important to them. And adults are okay, but man, I go to town with kids. And that's what we do. We have a big educational program with the museum and, and it amazes me. These little Bahamian kids, you know, they live in paradise and they don't know it. And, you know, we're, we're out here. I'm trying to convince them. Like everybody's trying to get here kids, you know, and a lot of these kids, they don't know about their own country. 
And so a challenge is getting them out, getting them on the beaches. We've, we've got this whole summer program we do where they pick up all this trash and then they identify it. I, I've got this whole program where we think it came from. We found potato chip bags from China one day. Um, but at the end of the day, they use it to make junk new outfits, which is kind of neat. And so, you know, the future of the Bahamas, it's, it's all about the kids. And uh, one thing my wife and I have done, we've, we've given away um, or donated uh, up to 1,400 Amazon tablets to the school kids because all they have is books. And a lot of the books were destroyed in Dorian. And so all of a sudden, you know, instead of an encyclopedia, now I have a device that could have every book written on the man on it. And it's really, as a matter of fact, it woke up the government and they started matching us on donations. And so I'm trying to turn the Bahamas into like Silicon Beach, you know, where they need to attract these big fan companies someday. And the only way to do that, you know, is through their kids. And they got to bring them up, you know, electronically like the rest of the world. And and it's amazing whether oh, there's some smart ones. I mean, let me tell you guys, if you find them, the, the ones that pick up on it are the smart ones. And, uh, you know, that's, we've we focused on them to get them out diving, to teach them about the, the pollution problems, teach them about salvage, um it's it's really cool it's awesome how uh you know how's been working with the the bahamian government i know that there was a policy that you had that you pretty much use all all bahamian you know contractors and and try to try to you know just do, do the right thing and and fulfill you know the economy around around the northern bahamas and the bahamas in general like how how has that been working with the government and the and the local contractors well, that's a great question. I mean, um, again, my, it was very important to me when we started Walkers that as much Bahamian labor contractors that we could get. And I'm proud to say that as we sit, it's been almost 100%. Um, but, the, you know, the challenge has been when you have uh, uh, two governments now. <laughs> I had a government change uh, last October, and I was really getting tight with the last one. And it was, it was like, Oh my God, they're listening to me. They know what we're doing. They know all this stuff we're, we're doing for the islands. And, and then we, they lost the election. And for a minute there, I thought, Oh my God, I'm, I'm done. I've done all this here. And, and I've heard nightmares about when the government changes. And I got to tell you, I was called in 24 hours after the election. I was called into the prime minister's office and he did nothing but thank me. And it was one of the greatest days of my life. And I knew that I knew that we are going to be able to continue to do everything that we're doing. And uh, I'll, I'll say it, Mr. Davis, Mr. Brave Davis, the new prime minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, a tremendous man. And, and he's got a got a hard job ahead of him, but um, he's well liked by the people. And, and uh, you know, the, the government there, it's hard. I mean, they've, they've lost billions in, in the last couple of years of, of business and um, they've, they've got you know, bond payments coming up and, you know, there's healthcare problems and, and, and social security and, and, and what they need that will fix all of that in a week is they need Americans to come back. Okay. I mean, most of the marinas have been empty. The cruise ships obviously have had their issues and here we are again, they're, they're back and forth, back and forth, but, but eventually the little marinas, the, the backbone of the Bahamas, Please come back. We're here. We're open. You know, uh, I'm I'm just a gateway. Down south, little by little, everybody's opening back up. And, is it uh, is it difficult to get? I'm not I'm not familiar with the 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 process to get in into the Bahamas at this moment with the COVID and everything. I gotta I gotta go through there. You know, in a couple of weeks. But not so really. it's not the, bad. the previous prime minister was actually a doctor, uh, a, a, a incredible man, and a guy named Doctor Minnis and. Um, quite timely to have a doctor as a prime minister during a pandemic. And I I think everybody will give him huge praise uh, for the way that he kept, you know, he really kept the pandemic at bay. What he wasn't able to keep at bay was the economy. And so, you know, here we sit, uh, there's probably, uh, I just talked to a good friend of mine who owns owns the Marina down south of me. And he says last, they're, they're getting some weekend traffic. Okay. But at the end of the day, if, if we can get these marinas 60, 70% full, it helps the whole country. I mean, from the people baking to the people doing bone fishing trips to serving food to making food, you know, everywhere. And, and I can't stress enough to you how bad 
it's been for some of these folks. And, and, you know, we've been a little bit of a bright spot out there because we have been people, pe- keeping people employed and, and there's been, you know, 50 to 75 people uh, at a day when we can, when we can get them there. But to answer your question, uh, the current law is that you have to be tested within three days of travel to the Bahamas. And then you have to be tested within 48 hours that you're in the Bahamas. Okay. So that can be a little bit tricky. Um, I don't know about most resorts. I'm sure, you know, NASA is fine. I know at Walkers, uh, we do. We have that ability at our, at our custom shop to test you once you've been tested uh, or once you're in the country, you can be tested. And it's basically pretty easy. It's just an electronic form after that. And then you don't need anything to get back into the U.S. right now. I hope that it becomes easier and easier. It seems like more and more you hear of more and more regulations being lifted. So hopefully it becomes keeps on becoming easier. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. You want to talk about the fleet a little bit? Yeah. I mean, dude, dude, I, I, I always find it for people in your position, you know, you, you have a, you have a corporation under yourself with just the, uh, just, just, just your, just your boats, you know, I mean, how many, how many people crew members do you have amongst the five, four or five boats? Uh, you well, if you look at the, there's two fleets that we operate. One is my personal fleet. And then we have the whole salvage fleet. And between the whole crew, I think there's 14 vessels and there's 47 crew members. Wow. Incredible. And so quick story on how it all started is that this is right after I sold the company. Um, my wife's birthday is in September and I knew I was going to do something. And we hadn't bought walkers, but I knew it was a part of it. And so I went out and at the time it wasn't as hot as it is right now. And I love Westports and specifically love their 164s. And so I went out and there was a, one of them that was on the market. And I believe it a little bit uh, bias here, but I believe it was the best one. Uh, she's a 2010, uh, 164 feet. She draws eight feet. She's got a crew of 11. Uh, and I, Surprised my wife with it, put a bow on it. We walked up to it and I said, it's yours. And she couldn't believe that I bought a white boat. She's like, oh my God, (laughs) all I've ever bought is fishing boats in my life. And and she was shocked that I bought this beautiful, glamorous boat, you know. Well, right down the road after that happened to be the Florida Fort Lauderdale boat ship. And she goes, well, why do you need to go to that? And I said, well, I, I bought your boat. Now we got to go find mine. And it was uh, something that I knew I wanted. I knew I needed a yacht support vessel for a lot of reasons. One is when you have a yacht, you can put all the crap on this support vessel. and You can keep that yacht totally clean. And it's wonderful. Okay. So we keep everything on the axis. The axis is I, I saw it. It was at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show. I saw it from a distance. There was people climbing all over it. And I turned to my CEO and I said, that's it. Let's go. We want to buy that. And he said, what? You haven't even looked at it yet. I said, I I don't need to. And so this absolutely wonderful company, Damon, um, there's an old saying, if it ain't Dutch, it ain't much. (laughs) And and, uh, the the Axis is a 183 steel bottom aluminum superstructure beast. She's got four uh, Caterpillar main drives and she's got three Caterpillar big generators in it. So it's at the boat show, it's like a Caterpillar uh, showroom down there, but it holds everything. Got a big deck, submarine. I've got a small airplane that actually goes on there. It's got a full dive shop, all the tenders. Um, the bridge looks like something out of the future. It's it's incredible. We've got a an extra system in there, which look that up. It's a real sophisticated system where you don't have to go. We're, we're one of the few vessels in the world that can go paperless because it updates all the time. Um, and so the Axis really was sort of the fulcrum of, of everything that I wanted to do. And we really welcomed it to, to the family. I called it Axis because of a couple of reasons. It's got a big ax bow for one. And two, it gives me Axis, you know, to everything we do and access to the world. So, and then, you know, I'm, I love to do everything else hunting fish, but I'm a big fisherman and um, I've got a great captain, this young kid from Stewart who's worked for me for a long time, Ian Weber. Um, he was called the uh, 
fish master in one of the one of the magazines once that went right to his head. Uh, but we started out in a in a well, hell, we started out in a 39 CV fishing. And then a little later, this is actually before the GD, a little later I got into a 52 uh, Viking Express. Loved that boat, caught my biggest fish in that it, off a of mystique. We caught an 800 pound blue down there. Um, that got a little challenging keeping up with the fleet. So we ended up a few years ago getting a 68 Viking and uh, open bridge. And I'm like, oh my God, I've arrived. This is it. This is the only one I'm ever gonna need. I'm done. And last summer, Gigi, my yacht, got struck by lightning and it took it out for six months and I got sort of tight living on that 68. And so about a month into it, we bought an 80 and it uh, has an enclosed bridge. I never thought I would like an enclosed bridge and I am never going back. I mean, it's so good for weather. You got an extra room up there. Um, It's just a place to go. You want to be quiet. I got a tower. Um, We've fallen in love with that boat. We've had it about two months now and, and already caught a blue with it and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I got a CV. And then the other real passionate thing that I'm all about is the backcountry. I mean, I'd, I'd just as well be bone fishing out in the backcountry than out there with the blues. And so I've got three Hell's Bays. Uh, I've got a Marquesas edition that's about four years old, an old model whip spray. It's like a 16.8. 1680 thing. And then, uh, God bless Hell's Bay. They made me a, uh, Walker's K edition. Wow. And, uh, it was sort of an upgrade from the Marquesas and I got to customize it a little bit. And one of my favorite things is just, we run 40 miles out, 40 miles back and, and hit it all. And part of what I'm going to have on walkers on the West end, it's going to be a very different experience than the Marina. You know, there's gonna be a lot of hustle and bustle and grills and sports fishing and, you know, cleaning fish. The other end is going to be the Bonefish Lodge that'll be great for like a corporate retreat, um, you know, bachelor party, wedding party. It'll sleep like 10. I'll have a fleet of Hell's Bays. Got a deal going with Hell's Bays. And one of the neat things is there's about six or seven bone fishing guides over there at Little Grand Key that, that want to come back to work that know that area like the back of the hand oh. and can't wait to get back to work. And so, if, you know, being a bonefish guide in the Bahamas, and history has been one of the finest jobs you could have, you know, yeah, and you yeah. listen to some of these stories that I've heard guys fishing with Richard Nixon and, you know, guys, uh, you know, fist fixing with all these singers and golf pros. And, and it's, uh, it's just something I, I, I want to bring it all back. And that's part of it is, is the back country. I don't want to have too much back country because it's pristine. Oh my God. I don't want to ruin it. It's yeah. so nice. You know, oh, it's hard to be, with all that said, uh, I mean, I have to ask you about my my favorite show, Walker's K Chronicles. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, I mean, did you ever you ever get the bone fish with flip pallet or anything? Well, I'll tell you a quick flip pallet story. You know, I'm like you. I grew up watching it. You know, I was actually I was I was I think I was 30 when it came out. My wife and I were living in Atlanta, and it would come on real early in the morning on Sundays. Yep. And my wife's like, I'm going to wake up to watch Flip at six in the morning. You won't go to church at 1030. You know, and I'm like, wait a minute. This is my church, you know. <laughs> and so when I bought Walkers, or actually before I bought Walkers, I said, you know, I have to meet Flip Pat. I absolutely have got to get to meet this man. Yeah. And long story short, we're, we're very, very good friends now. But, but I called him up two weeks before I bought the island and said, hey, my name's Carl Allen. I've got a contract to buy Walker's K. We're closing in a few weeks, blah, blah, blah. And he said, yeah, yeah, I've been hearing that. Uh, you know, call me back when it's real and blah, blah, blah. Because, <laughs> you know, I caved in five times. And so I said, hey, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. I'm a big fan. I, you know, just listen to me for a minute. Can, can I buy you dinner? And he says, all right, all right. So I went up to, he lives in this tiny little town in northern Florida, the middle of nowhere. And I pull up and it was exactly what I thought the man to be. I mean, he, <laughs> he was he was carving a, a, a wild turkey hanging in his backyard as I walked up and kind of nonchalantly, you know, yeah, who are you? But one of the coolest moments of my life happened that evening is we were sitting in his living room and we had had dinner and we were drinking this frigate rum, which we're partners on now. And my cell phone rang and it, it was my lawyer. And he said, congratulations, Mr. Allen, you own Walker's kid. Wow. Wow. Uh choked up as I sit here, but, but I was sitting there with Flip and, uh, you know, I, I, 
can see a little tear yeah. come out of his, uh, his face. And um, I've told that story a few times and that, that, um, that moment he fucking believed me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's incredible. Like what, what yeah. are the odds of that phone call with that, with Flip Powell that night? Um, yeah. And then since then he get out and if you get a chance, it's on YouTube, but it's the return to Walker's King. We did it about two years ago and, and he comes back, he takes the Hell's Bay at night across the Gulf Stream into Walker's, him and him and his buddy. And, and he shows up there on my yacht. I go, Flip, this is crazy. He slept for 22 hours. I told him, you're not going back. So I bought Flip's boat. That's the Marquesas that I have. <laughs> and he did this 20 minute video that is absolutely spectacular. You got to go watch it. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, he's not a uh, he's not a spring chicken anymore to be doing stuff like that. <laughs> so, I'm telling you, I know Flip pretty well these days, and he's one. I feel bad because he he is not he doesn't he's not vaccinated. He never will be, but he doesn't leave his area. He's he's either fishing in or hunting somewhere where nobody else is. And I'll call him in the morning and say, quiet, I've got a javelina coming up, you know, or quiet, I, you know, I'm, I'm throwing a fly, you know, you know, and <laughs> he hasn't changed a bit. And, you know, uh, he's, I think he's 80. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, bringing back the Chronicle. I mean, that's, that's really- I think that'd be amazing. Yeah, wow. I mean, that, that would be something, you know. The problem we have right now, ESPN owns it, and I'm not gonna say too many bad things about them right here, but- <laughs> They have agreed to let me view each episode for $500. I said, well, I'll pass on that right now. But that's the challenge. I can't call it the Chronicles, but, you know. And then the thing, you know, Flip used kind of Walkers as sort of the show beginning, and he did a few shows out there. Mm -hmm. But really, he was a traveling show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you could do a show just about what we do at Walkers. Yeah. And that's Absolutely. something, that, you know, we'd like to talk. I understand you guys are doing our uh, release flags. Yes, we are. Yeah, for the for the tournament. We're very excited for that. So yes. thank you. Yes, those came out really nice. Yeah. Yes. We might need some pink ones. Absolutely. And Absolutely. what do you recommend for a child one? A child. Or a kid's a kid's flag. Yeah. We have a kid's uh uh section or okay. category. Yeah, we'll we'll uh we'll brainstorm about that. But yeah, well we could make something. Okay. So yeah, so that's about it. Walkers, you know, it's it's uh bonefish meet the billfish. Love to have you guys out sometimes. You want to come check it out. We we always got a few little cottages for people to stay. Um, you know, just walking around and I take a fly ride with them when I walk around. You can catch bonefish right off the beach. Amazing. And, uh, we we like to go out in the C V and you know, catch the mutton, catch the pompano, go out in the you know, the big boat and we we get the marlin uh the wahoo and and uh my favorite time out there is is the spring tuna fishing and just going out there and chasing the birds yeah and we, we literally we back right up to this stuff we catch sometimes we'll catch live pilters and we will throw a bunch of pilters at them and just have a school around the back of the boat i mean it just doesn't get any better than that we do that with dorado too when the dorado come um uh, i've run up to that buoy off of uh oh wow how's that it, it, it's exactly 100 miles from walkers about seven out of 10 times, you'll nail them out there. But we've had a couple of bad trips. Yeah. Now, here's one thing. I think two things I wanted to mention while I had you guys. Uh, you know, one, I'm going to put fads in. That's what I was about to ask you. <laughs> okay. That's, yeah. I've been in contact with some really knowledgeable characters that have a lot of experience doing it, and they're very excited. And yeah. so I'm going to stretch them at different depths about 20 miles. Wow. And I, something that I, I do believe I'll get some of that project done this year, not before the tournament, but, but I think I will um, share some of the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I get this question a lot, um, you know, about my million dollar Marlin. I don't know if you guys have heard that. Story. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so has that, yeah. Uh -huh. People have asked, is that still in existence? Yeah. So I, I went to uh it was the custom shootout. Uh, Skip Smith tournament last year or two years ago now. Um, I, I think I had a few rum and cokes and I was trying <laughs> to promote walkers a little bit and uh, got up there and spouted this million dollar fish. And so I, uh, you know, kind of had to stick to it a little bit. So here's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've done, I did it for the tournament last year. It's, it's a million dollars if you catch it during the tournament right now. Okay. okay. But I'm going to open it up unless somebody wins it. I'm going to open it up to everybody the first year that we're open for business. Okay. Wow. And now the only caveat here 
is, you know, because I don't want a frozen fish coming in from Portugal. You know, one of the things you're going to have to do is check in at Walker's. Okay. okay. Because again, I don't want a frozen fish showing up from Portugal okay, <laughs> so that we know that you started there. You can go as far as you want from there, but you have to come back to Walker's obviously. Okay. And then within a 24 hour period. So, you know, I got, I have to have some rules otherwise. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Who knows? Who knows what would happen if, if I just said, you know, somebody no, coming from Bermuda. <laughs> yeah. Or from even Bermuda. Bermuda's not that far. So yeah. uh, well, that's, 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 that's exciting. Pretty amazing, Mr. Allen. Your your passion for the area and the uh, and just your love for just you know what you're doing is pretty incredible. I just it's pretty admirable to to I feel like you're doing it in the in the right way. You know, being cognizant of the environment and and the and the local economy and the people. I think that's that's pretty admirable because you don't see that in some places. You know. Yeah, I I mean I don't want to bring all these people back to something that we ruin. I mean it doesn't yeah. make sense. I mean matter of fact, we got to figure out some ways. To enhance it, uh, yeah. you know, one of the things I'm doing is that uh, I hooked up with some cats about bait fish because I'm I don't want people decimating my pilcher population. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think that when we open, I'm going to be selling goggle eyes. Nice. And you know they're real stout. Um, you know you can take those out anywhere, and it'll keep people away from because those pilchers, everything feeds on those pilchers. You know, yeah. just, you, you know they're sort of the beginning of the food chain out there. So. But, uh, uh, but yeah. hundred bucks a dozen or that. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you look at what they sell in Florida. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't I, even think I'll do that. I think I'm going to sell them a cost uh, just, to, just to keep people away from my built. You, know? well, yeah, yeah. you can go get those Bahamian goggle eyes. This, this Walker's K run over there, get those Walker's K goggle eyes, make win a couple tournaments and then yeah. everybody. Oh, will, right. will want those. <laughs> That'd be something. Wouldn't it? <laughs> I wouldn't put it past the, the guys that, <laughs> that Nick fishes against and Nick himself. So Anthony, is that a sports fish? I see you're sitting on. There? Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, our, we're getting ready for a trip and we we're on us on the blood money, 64 case and here in Wrightsville beach, getting ready to go. So kind of, chaotic my mate's been running around so i apologize for that but um yeah 64 casing custom hope to hope the b go to walkers eventually yeah awesome we'd love to have you guys yeah so well awesome. well we appreciate it mr allen it was yeah, it was great amazing great great to hear what you're doing doing over there and, and the way you're doing it i think is like i said is really admirable you can see it go other ways in a lot of different places you know so i think it's appreciated by all the the, the time you're taking to do it in the right way. So we appreciate the time. Uh, thank you very much, guys. All right. Thank you, Carl. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll hope Thanks to see you well. soon.